Barely two months ago, the uh, National Assembly had approved uh, $8.9 billion loan for uh, the current administration. And of course, in the news in the last 48 hours, President Mohamed Wari has once again sought another $4.9 billion uh, loan. Nigeria's current debt profile is, you know, about 3 uh, $35 trillion naira and climbing. Both political parties have, uh, well, once, you know, defended or come against this loan. And of course, earlier in the morning, we had spoken about Senator Ali Undume, who was berating the National Assembly for the speed with which they went ahead to approve the request of another $4.9 billion loan by the current administration. This morning, we're speaking with economist Ken Ife uh, to share his thoughts on this. Good morning, Mr. Ife. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Oh, hi. Good morning, and thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Now, let's start with your views or your thoughts on you know, another $4.9 billion loan request. Uh, looking at where we are coming from, in, you know, from 2015 and what Nigeria's debt profile was then and where we currently are, do you agree with the narrative that Nigeria needs to continue to borrow in order to build? The answer is yes. Um, the reason is because there are so many things that we need to do. And all of them require investment. Uh, even to fight corruption, you require investment in technology systems. Anything security, you need, you need investment. To create jobs, you need public investment in public works. To fight COVID, you need investment. And if you don't have the money, if you don't have your savings, the only alternative you have is to either sell your assets or go and borrow. Um, there are laws guiding our borrowing this time round, quite unlike in 2005. In 2005, we didn't even know how much we are owing. They said it's just over $30 billion. 40% of that money was actually uh, penalties and, and missing payment and all kinds of things. But this time round, we have, uh, we have, first of all, borrowing is on the uh, exclusive legislative list. Uh, also is, is governed by Fiscal Responsibility Act 2007. And the law says if you want to borrow, it doesn't matter whether it's domestic or foreign, it has to be for capital expenditure and human resource development. And then it also states that uh, the, you need to have a fiscal strategy paper that captures what you want to do, a medium term expenditure framework. And then that borrowing has to be on concessionary terms and the oil, a long term frame. So the law is very, very clear on what needs to be done in, in, in connection with having more transparency, accountability, and prudence in public finance markets. So the question now is do we really need to borrow? And the answer is of course we need to borrow. And the, uh, if we're even crying about this particular request, it's part of 2018, 2020. Uh, MF. We are still going to grow more and more under the 2021 to 2024 million term expenditure framework. Now, the, the particular money is asking for has already been foreseen by the fiscal strategy. It has been captured in the million term expenditure framework. It was is in the growing plan. It's been approved by National Assembly and all relevant authorities, FEC, all of them. And what happens that at the point of joy, you still have to come back to the mission assembly and still seek permission again. So it's in the works. The second question is how necessary is it for us to borrow? Every country in the world borrows, even the richest country, America, borrows in trillions of dollars. In our own case, we are confronted with major challenges. But first of all, the two visions of Nigeria today. Uh, from PwC is that in 2030 our GDP will rise to 1.64 trillion, and then in 2050 it will rise to 6.4 trillion. And the thing is that it's inconceivable that in the current state of our GDP, uh, out, that we're ever going to get to that level of output without investing in, uh, in infrastructure, which is the infrastructure base that supports the order of revenue that we expect. So we need to invest in infrastructure. And the stock of infrastructure in Nigeria is only 35% of our GDP. And just comparing us to South Africa, it is 8% of the GDP. 
Many countries are 100% or more of their GDP. It tells you the story of the city of infrastructure. Now you come to the second aspect, which is security. The security situation that we have in Nigeria is existential. If you do nothing, that's not an option. Because they would be the, the, what we call it, the headers, the terrorists, the bandits, and the kidnappers, they would chase all of us out of, out of this country. Just as it has happened in, in, in um, what's this country again? In the, it's not it's, it's Pakistan. What's the name of this country that has just gone bomb? So, so it's not an option at all. And the second challenge, which is COVID, um, is, is, is existential as well. Because COVID is a matter of life and death. And you couldn't do nothing. Do nothing is not an option. Because people are dying in thousands. And you can sit back. Nobody does that. And even the promise from the international uh, uh, bodies that we're going to give us 20% of our population, which is 40 million uh, vaccines. We haven't seen that. We've only got 4 million. So the government has to brace up to find money to buy COVID to save our population. Or is it employment that they are going to say, oh, no, we're not going to put money in public works? Don't do that. And then you see all the young boys and girls who are unemployed, 3% of our population, uh, of our unemployment rate. You know, they will come out on the street and chase everybody out of, out of the office. So some of these challenges are existential, and we have to do something about them. You can't worship money and sit back and say, let, let, the, let the world go by. It's not possible. Okay, Mr. Ken Ife, as at June 2021, Nigeria's external debt, you know, climbed to over 13 uh, trillion naira. And as of June 2021, Nigeria's domestic debt, you know, was over 21 uh, trillion naira as well. So would you say that the current state of Nigeria's infrastructure justifies our previous borrowing? Okay, let's look at the infrastructure still. Now, just before this administration, I'm not the spokesman of the administration, but just before they came in, what we had was all roads abandoned. People, contractors were not getting paid, so they all abandoned the roads. But when they came in, they didn't go to our work fresh contract. They just said, all oh, everybody should get back to the site, and they start paying whatever they have. And they, of course, they have to throw some of that money. So what you now have is that all highways, everywhere in the country, there is somebody somewhere there doing work. We haven't completed mo most of them at all, and far from it, the work is going on. And the people are being paid, their work is going on. And look at rail. The last investment in rail was in 1957. Now, why rail? Rail is the cheapest and the most efficient and effective means of transporting large goods across long distances. That is a start, that's, that's a known fact. But now look at the impact of what has been, it's a very expensive project to lay build tracks. But look at the ones that have been successful. Look at the, uh, uh, look at the impact of that. On, 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 everybody's happy about that. Then look at Lagos, they battle. See, the impact is going is having. And the thing is, there's no way you could be thinking about having building a deep sea port, making deep sea port, without planning to have rail to evacuate the goods, because the deep sea port is more than has a capacity of more than all the other ports put together. All the roller ports and and the, the, the can and, and the, the all of them put together is, is more than the capacity. So for you to not plan for rail for evacuation means you are, you are, you are saying forget Lagos as an economic center. And that's not going to happen. And I remember when I was uh, writing a bid for tendering for Lagos to uh, Portugal to Medugri, uh, Eastern Coastal, uh, Eastern Rail. Uh, uh, I, I remember that I did a plan that showed that by 2035, we could generate $1 trillion of GDP in that coastal corridor, that, that um, Eastern Corridor. And that gives you an idea of the lot of revenue that you could bring in in the country when you have the rail. I'll give you another example. If you're moving grains from anywhere in the north, Atsina or Kebi, if you're moving one ton of grains from Lagos or Port Harcourt, 
it costs you between 75,000 and 100,000 naira per ton. And that's one of the reasons why you have this runaway inflation when it comes to food. Now, the, the thing is that if you are using rail, and, and some of the people that would have done that journey in one day spend three days on the road because of security challenges. But if you are using rail to move that, it won't cost up to 5,000 naira. So the rail is so critical in the, in, in, the, in the range of infrastructure. Of course, if nobody will be here, let's not. Mr. Mr. Kenife, um, can, can you hear me? I'm listening, I'm hearing Yes, you. so when we talk about infrastructure, it seems that in the Nigerian situation, because of the poor state of our roads, we seem to focus just on road and rail. But there's so no, much more to infrastructure, no, no, including no. aviation infrastructure, water infrastructure, waste management infrastructure, communications infrastructure, infrastructure regarding bridge, regarding power and energy. So when we look across all these types of infrastructure, away from road and rail, even inclusive of road and rail, would you say that our borrowing of, to, you know, to the terms of trillions of Naira, and the government, you know, has been able to use all that money to invest in these different parts you know, of the country for the betterment of Nigerians? Well, if you just mentioned power. 60% of the manufacturers in this country say that they provide power for themselves 90% of the time. If you go to the website of MAN, 77% of the manufacturers say that their greatest challenge is power. Power accounts for 30% of people cost. Transportation, 20%. This two alone is giving you 50% of the cost. We cannot be competitive going forward. And you talked about telecommunication infrastructure. We have the highest teledensity in, 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 in Africa because of the huge investment from the, on, on infrastructure. Then you said the water, is it the, the aviation? We just built five, over $800 million to build five new terminals, international terminals, in our international airport. And that is a big boost to aviation. And we're looking to concession those. So the issue is this. Only 35%, our stock of infrastructure is only 35%. We're still so far away mm. compared to our economies. So we have to invest in infrastructure. The challenge, we should move the debate to the uh, appropriateness of the investment and the integrity of the investment and the sustainability of the investment. Mm -hmm. And then here I will tell you that the law says we have to carry out the cost-benefit analysis on any debt. And you see that the debt management office tries to do that. And then the issue about whether, whether we are succeeding, people are voting with their feet. It's, I'm not here to defend government. I'm just here to put the facts down. And then we can have a, a, a useful discussion over this. Yeah. Um, um, Mr. Financial ratios that the law prescribes have not actually been violated so far. Because there's only one financial ratio in the FRA 2007, which is the uh, fiscal deficit to GDP, which it wants to be kept at 3%. But it's gone over 3%, about 3.6%, and the Finance Act has amended, and then now the whole act is now being amended by the Senate. So otherwise, it didn't set any standard for the others. The, the, the benchmark for debt, the total debt to GDP is about 40%. That's the international benchmark for uh, low-income countries like ourselves, but for other advanced countries, 60%. The thing is, we are still around 30, 30%. If you add everything, it's about 4%. And that is including including the 10 billion naira the central bank gave to government in $5 billion as overdraft. Of course, that is now being committed to a 30-year loan, a long-term loan, uh, with two-year moratorium, which says that they are not going to start in, you know, in the life of this particular parliament. So, so that is the story. Now, what they have, I have to tell you, is that most countries in the world are violating those limits because they have infrastructure. And it's over 250% debt to GDP ratio. America is almost 100%. In all these other countries are between 80 and 100%. That is because they have infrastructure. Ours, we don't have it. That's why we have to invest and make sure that the investment has to be to economic uh, projects that are capable of repaying that loan and retiring the loan. But if you invest it in anything like, you know, if you want to use it to build roads to a minister's home or whatever, you're on your own. You're supposed to connect up industrial and economic centers so that they're able to energize the economy and have a reasonable return on the investment. 
The one challenge we have is this. In the second class of infrastructure, government has to do them before you bring in the private sector to run and manage those. That is one challenge that we have. The health infrastructure, you still have to do those before you get the services end of people to come and manage. Education, the same. Luckily, we have private sector investing heavily in education, uh, more investors than the federal government, but you still need to do the basic and then enable them. We, we can also go further with this. Um, um, the, 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 picture, the picture that you've painted mostly, you know, it, it, it's almost a picture that seems like Nigeria is not Losing your voice. I'm not hearing you. I'm saying the picture that you've painted really is that Nigeria is not making any money. And so the only way that we can run the country and continue to build forward is to borrow, um, which may not be very, very true. And also, you know, it seems like we have completely ignored um, multiple ways with which Nigeria can save funds and use some of these funds uh, for this same infrastructure that we are borrowing for. Um, so I want you to speak on wastage of funds in Nigeria and also the Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project has, of course, sued the government and asked that this loan not be approved until the government is able to show spending details of the trillions of Naira you know, uh, debt that we've gathered since 2015. Do you agree with Serap? Yes. Accountability is what we all have to be pursuing. The legitimacy of the debt is something that will come from asking questions. The sustainability of the debt is the key issues that we need to focus on. And I agree that the, the challenge is more around the ability to repay. But that is where the trouble lies. In a way, you don't have this in the law. The international benchmark is that your debt service to your government revenue should not really be more than 40%. Last year, we started with 91% in the first quarter and ended up at 83%. This year, government projected that the debt service to be around, to government revenue will be around 46.8%. As, as I, if you saw the newspaper yesterday, the, 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 this day, the headline was the, the, the President is chairman of the Presidential Advisory Council, Economic Advisory Council, uh, Dr. Salami, said that it was 98%. As that, you know, for the first quarter, first half of the year, it was 98%. That is the debt service to GDP. That looked alarming, but I had to debunk that in, in some of the interviews I had yesterday. Now, the issue is this do we do nothing? And I've told you, I gave you three examples. We are doing nothing is not an option. So the thing is now, how do we raise more revenue? Nigeria is our our government revenue to GDP is six to seven percent. That's the lowest in Africa. We should increase that. But how do you increase that? Are you going to increase that by simply doubling the tax on existing uh, footprint? You can't do that. And I can tell you the reason why you can't do that. You do more by widening the tax base and bring more people into the tax net. Two, you block the leakages. This group lose about eight billion dollars a year on on illicit transfers. Block the leakages, and the government is aware and they're doing something about that. We also reckon that I remember when I went to speak to the Senate uh, Committee on Finance uh, two weeks, three weeks ago. They were saying the chairman there was saying that the money was spent on tax waivers for some of the manufacturers um, and also the leakages in the system are actually higher than revenue that government is getting. So I can now see government trying to reduce that exposure and do more. And we also saw that this whole necessity has pushed government to quickly sign the PIA, that is the Petroleum Industry Act, which has been going on for over 20 years. And it is a good, a good act because it gives us a starting point in dealing with this sustainability issue. The process has been passed Human revenue came and said that next year they're expecting to double their revenue, that they will get over 10 trillion, and which means that the likelihood of this whole revenue doubling next year is there. And that means there is less fiscal stress. It's the aspect of fiscal stress. So there are many things. Now, yesterday again, two days ago, Central Bank announced that they are going out to raise 15 trillion 
for the infrastructure company. Now, infrastructure PLC has been capitalized at one trillion by the government. And that's a private sector run operation. Now, the impact of that is that they're going to grow Naira, 15 trillion, and then they can now offload all these projects that government is spending so much money, growing so much on. The private sector will roll and run with these projects. So that can now free federal government from all of this uh, foray into infrastructure. All right, Mr. Ife. Um, I want you to please talk about you know what you think Nigeria's strategy for repayment is. You've, you've mentioned that about two times now. So with all this borrowing, what's our strategy for repayment? How do you think you know our debt profile might, might imp affect our economy? And lastly, um, the the People's Democratic Party has been saying that the APC is simply accumulating debts and just high spending, wrecking Nigeria. That's what the PDP has said. How do you respond to that? I'm not interested in what the politicians are saying because I'm a, I'm a technocrat and I just have to give these figures and facts and interpret them as I can. What I have I've applied, I've applied for you, the measures that I have seen that are taking place, including the Petroleum Industry Act that is now going to give us more comfort measures. You've seen subnational levels have also need to pull their weight in revenue generation. And then that technology has come in. If you see Lagos State uh, bringing, uh, doubling and tripling their revenue because they allow technology to drive the, the IGR. Uh, and then many more states are going through the same method. And if you look at federal government in fighting leakages, they had to bring in IPIS, which is the, uh, in the payroll, yeah. payroll uh, software, and then chief mix. And they also had about the, the uh, treasury single account. How it has continued to shrink the territory of those bandits that are eating our money. So, and, and you've seen when they when they run DVN over the IPIS, you see some civil servants that have 44 accounts, 45 accounts, payroll accounts. So, all of these are technology, but you must invest in those technologies. But it even help to fight corruption. So, that, that's the thing. Technology is going to do a lot more for us in helping us to the whole. And they're investing in those. So there are many ways the government is looking at to improve our, our revenue and then to bring more comfort to population in terms of our ability to repay the loans. But if you are telling me that you're going to shut down, you're not going to borrow anything, you don't have any savings, then I'll say you must be joking because you're just going to get all the young people out on the street mm. and then you're going to get uh, overrun by, by bandits and terrorists and, uh, and nappers something else, you know, so it, it, it's not an option. All right. Um, Kennifer, I think we can uh, wrap it up here. Thank you very much for joining us and for your analysis this morning. Thank you. Uh, we wish you a very interesting weekend ahead. Thanks once again. Thank you, Thank you very much. Absolutely. And this is where we will be wrapping up the conversation this morning. Thanks so much for being with us all through the week. Uh, remember where you can catch up on any of the conversations you may have missed this week. It's simply on our uh, social media platform at Plus TV Africa on Facebook and Instagram. And thank you very much for being a part of our week. It's the final edition um, for this week in the month of September. Um, do have a great weekend. I am Annetta Felix. And I am Osaogi Ogbawa.